today I'm going to be telling you about dark matter and compact stars and galactic structure. First, let me thank the organizers very much for the kind invitation. Uh, my name is Joe Bermonte, as was said. I'm, I'm at Queen's University, um, Arthur B. McDonald uh, Astroparticle Research Institute, and I spend some time at Perimeter. All right, so you can find me any of those places. Uh, so the three topics I'll be covering today are dark matter heating neutron stars through either uh, kinetic energy, infall, and also if they annihilate in the neutron star, they can heat it up as well. I'll then be covering asymmetric dark matter in particular, and we'll talk about why it's asymmetric, causing neutron stars to implode and connections to missing pulsars uh, as a signature of that. And then I'll round off with actually a very similar phenomenon, which is white dwarf explosions from asymmetric dark matter. And I'll talk about what this can do to type 1a supernovae and galactic structure. If you have questions during the talk, feel free to jump in, raise hands. I'm cool with that. All right. Uh, so first, let me just talk about neutron stars in general. So neutron stars are really great for looking for dark matter of all sorts of uh, varieties, like the ones we just heard about. Uh, and that's because you can think of them as nature's dark matter accelerators. So at the surface of a neutron star, before it hits the neutron star, dark matter will be moving at a sizable fraction of the speed of light. Uh, it's a very massive system, and because it's so dense, it ends up being sensitive to rather small dark matter nucleon scattering cross-sections. So this is the cross-section per nucleon for dark matter to be entirely captured, or all the dark matter flowing through the neutron star to be captured. So that's sort of your starting point for any sort of um, uh, phenomenology. And then you can think about lower cross-sections and capturing a little bit less dark matter. So an idea that I've explored in the last five years is this idea of that dark matter could kinetically or annihilation-wise heat neutron stars. So if dark matter is sped up in the gravitational potential of the neutron star, it'll deposit a ton of kinetic energy, and it could also annihilate inside the neutron star. And it turns out that the end product of this are neutron stars heated to around 1,750 Kelvin uh, if it's just kinetic energy, and 2,500 Kelvin if it's annihilation as well. Uh, you can compare that to the late stage temperature of a neutron star without this sort of dark matter heating, and that turns out to be around 100 Kelvin after a billion years. If that number seems a little bit low to you from your familiarity with white dwarfs, definitely ask about that. We can talk about why that's a little different from what you see with white dwarfs. Uh, and so uh, a while back, I had a paper on what the sensitivity roughly would be for this sort of a dark sector. And compared to bounds either then, or you can compare it here to the neutrino fog bound, uh, neutrino fog line, uh, it, it does pretty well uh, both for annihilation and kinetic heating. Uh, since that time, a lot of papers have come out looking at different aspects of this, and it turns out that this sort of a, a, a paradigm would be sensitive to a lot of different kinds of dark matter. Uh, I'll just mention a few of my favorites. You can think about leptophilic dark matter because the interior of the neutron star actually has a sizable uh, fraction of its uh, constituent particles that are electrons. Uh, you can even think about muonphilic dark matter because there's actually a, a non-trivial fraction of the interior of the neutron star that are on-shell uh, muons. So you can think about scattering directly with muons. Um, you can think about lots of different electroequinos, and I'm doing a project right now uh, in this direction as well. And I've here only like briefly highlighted all the authors who have worked on this. Um, Chris Kuvaris is in the audience. You can talk to him about dark matter and neutron stars. He, had, uh, he, had, he has loads of papers on this. Um, uh, and uh, I guess uh, the other author you'll see it repeated over and over is Nicole Bell here. Uh, and like everything else in the uh, dark matter sector, you can actually trace some of this back to the 80s. So there's this paper by Goldman and Nisanov. All right. So where are we now with observing neutron star temperatures? So this is a plot of uh, almost every neutron star at low temperature that's been observed so far uh, on top of cooling curves, which start falling rapidly after about a million years. Um, and so later on, your cooling actually ends up being pretty simple. Um, here are some references if you want to go look at that. But the main point is you can see that the temperatures that we've measured for most neutron stars when we have measured a temperature are, are either upper bounds sitting in the 10 to the 6 Kelvin, uh, maybe down to like the 10 to the 5 Kelvin regime, but nowhere near this sort of 2,000, 3,000 Kelvin temperature that I talked about earlier. Because if we'd done that, then that would be it uh, for a lot of dark matter models. Uh, 
That is not actually the coldest neutron star observed yet, though. There was a set of observations done with the Hubble Space Telescope in 2019, where they actually measured a uh, neutron star temperature as being less than three times 10 to the four Kelvin. So this is about an order of magnitude away from where we would need to be to start setting limits, um, but is the current state of the art. Uh, so I don't have a really cold neutron star to tell you about today, but there are prospects for thinking about doing the sorts of measurements you would need to do in order to see dark matter heating of neutron stars in the coming, I'll say, decade or so. Uh, and that relates to uh, the current state of what is the closest pulsar to Earth, because you need as close a pulsar as possible so that you can see, um, uh, well, so that you can see a, a really, really faint signal in terms of uh, infrared or near-infrared photons. Uh, and so here's a list of uh, pulsars with distances as determined by dispersion measure. Uh, it turns out there's a lot of details associated with this that I'm currently working on. Um, but there are targets roughly in the 100 parsec range, and for something like uh, kinetic only or annihilation heating uh, of neutron stars, you think about using a lot of telescope time on a telescope like EELT or um, TMT, which are coming online in the next five to 10 years, uh, to do this sort of measurement. Uh, but let me tell you about something that you can do right now with the existing coldest pulsar, well, coldest pulsar slash neutron star ever measured. Uh, and that relates to um, dark matter accretion on neutron stars in a very particular regime. And so in order to introduce that, I have to briefly review uh, what would sort of be the collection radius or the radius from the neutron star that collects dark matter for either collisionless dark matter or an extremely collisional dark matter model. Uh, so for collisionless dark matter, the collection radius goes like V escape over V dark matter. And for those aficionados in the room, you can actually understand this as a gravitational Sommerfeld enhancement to something like uh, the scattering of the star on the particle. Uh, for Bondi accretion, though, the uh, rate of accretion onto the neutron star will actually be determined by V escape squared over V dark matter squared. And so then you'd square both of these to roughly determine the area of the neutron star as it sweeps through the halo for either collisionless or collisional dark matter accretion. And so if we think about a model, well, and so we know dark matter can't be this just by itself, so it can't have like a, an extremely collisional nature. But what we could think about is what if dark matter exists in subhalos, and in those subhalos it's very collisional. And so if I just pause it without telling you exactly how I do this, it would be in some dissipative dark sector, and we haven't studied exactly what dark matter, that dark matter model would look like, but I'm doing this to show you what neutron stars can do right now. Uh, if I posit there are spherical subhalos with a constant density, um, and I consider both collisionless and collisional accretion, uh, then I have a new problem, which is thinking about the neutron stars and how much they would intersect certain size subhalos with certain densities or certain masses in our galaxy. And so I'll briefly take you through that. Uh, it's a paper uh, recently with myself, uh, Bradley Kavanaugh and Nirmal Raj, um, and just show you that there is a little region of parameter space for this very special dark matter model where that three times 10 to the four Kelvin neutron star can already set a bound. Um, so in the upper plot here, what we have is the radius of subhalos versus their mass. And so without specifying anything about the dark matter parameter space, I can exclude this gray region just based on microlensing constraints on subhalos. But if I say on top of that, these subhalos will contain dark matter uh, that has this dark matter nucleon scattering cross-section and this dark matter mass, it turns out that in this little orange region, if all or a good fraction of my dark matter is inside those little subhalos uh, in the very simplified model that I introduced earlier, um, I can actually already exclude this parameter space uh, in terms of dark matter on nucleon scattering cross-section. So that's where things are right there. All right, so that brings me to the end of dark matter heating neutron stars. I'll next talk about asymmetric dark matter causing neutron stars to implode and connections to missing pulsars. Uh, just to orient you where we're going to be sitting in the parameter space, um, for those of you who have seen asymmetric dark matter uh, imploding neutron stars, uh, it turns out that you won't even need to capture all the dark matter in order to set these bounds. And so neutron star implosions, wherever you find them in the dark matter parameter space for asymmetric dark matter, typically already extend well below what underground experiments can do. And then I'll talk then a little bit how supernovae can also address this high mass uh, dark matter parameter space. 
Uh, before I go there, I want to talk a little bit more about how dark matter actually collects in and around the neutron stars. Um, so these are uh, uh, some fun figures that were uh, uh, made by my grad student Narani Tayagi for a different uh, uh, project, but I thought they're really nice. So if you want to think about what happens once dark matter is captured, then first it'll be captured and undergo, and undergo successive scatters in an orbit that's outside of the neutron star. Um, after a while, it will become fully contained within the neutron star. Uh, this, has become, uh, this has become known as T1 thermalization, the time it takes for it to uh, have a fully enclosed orbit in the neutron star. And then after a longer time, it'll become fully thermalized with the neutron star and collect in a small region in the neutron star interior. And so dark matter was captured, we've gone over that, then dark matter will thermalize, and it turns out when it's thermalized, it's in a kind of uh, harmonic, uh, uh, yes, so that will happen in a second to the star as well, which is it'll turn into a black hole, but yeah, just foreshadowing. Uh, so there's a harmonic oscillator potential, and um, so the dark matter is sort of oscillating around in that's potential, and more of it's collecting, and more and more is collecting, and you should think of this actually as being an extremely small region. Uh, for the dark matter model I like to think about, which is P, V mass, asymmetric dark matter, uh, it's about a, a region of the size of a millimeter in the interior of the neutron star. And once enough dark matter is captured, you can think about the self-gravitation condition, or you can do uh, uh, a very standard genes mass collapse treatment, and you'll get roughly the same answer. But once the density of dark matter in that ball is above the neutron star density, um, it will start collapsing. It'll shed the remaining gravitational potential energy it has left through colliding with the neutrons in the neutron star. And then you want to check that it uh, exceeds its own degeneracy pressure so that it keeps collapsing, and this is roughly the condition for that to occur. Um, this is approximately 10 to the minus 12 solar masses for PV mass dark matter, just to give you a sense of the scale of this. And so when you talk about dark matter that would implode pulsars or neutron stars, um, if you think about just a standard GV mass asymmetric dark matter fermion, that's not going to do it because, as we already saw, um, I would need to collect much more of that. In fact, you already know how much you would need to collect. You'd need to collect uh, over a, a neutron star mass worth of uh, dark fermions in this case, so you'd have to collect more than a solar mass. Uh, that's not going to happen for any halos and the halo density that we know about. However, if you think about bosonic asymmetric dark matter, which were some of the first papers on this, um, which I listed earlier, uh, or if you think about PV to EV mass uh, asymmetric dark matter, uh, these two things um, will give you dark matter clumps that uh, can overcome their own degeneracy pressure. Um, in the case of the bosonic asymmetric dark matter, you need to think about its self-coupling here, given as lambda. But for fermions, you can just use that same Chandrasekhar mass estimate, and you'll get it roughly correct. And so I'll focus on this case of heavy asymmetric dark fermions. Um, just to give you a sense of where we would sit in parameter space relative to what we've seen so far, we have the WIMP miracle. But a simple way to get asymmetric dark matter up in this PV mass range uh, that I explored a number of years ago is to think about uh, some heavy field decaying after the dark matter freezes out. And then you can have basically the same paradigm you're used to. Uh, it just pushes ma the mass up about like a few orders of magnitude. OK. So asymmetric dark matter is captured. It thermalizes into a small ball in the neutron star interior. Uh, it'll collapse, and then it'll form a small black hole. It turns out that um, you're not done yet after you've uh, formed a small black hole, because the black hole can either be uh, big enough that it efficiently accretes the rest, uh, the neutron star surrounding it through uh, Bondi accretion, or it can be uh, so um, tiny that it actually evaporates away extremely quickly through Hawking evaporation. And there are actually additional terms that I haven't included here um, that I, I began introducing in like 2013 when I started uh, doing this after people like Chris Kavaris um, and uh, and then uh, mostly Chris Kouars, but other groups as well, looked into uh, dark matter uh, imploding neutron stars. Um, and one of those terms is, for instance, thinking about the, the dark matter itself feeding the black hole. Um, but if all of those conditions are met and you have a large enough black hole that you formed, then you can form a solar mass black hole 
which will rapidly consume the neutron star. And I didn't put slides from his work on this uh, into this talk, but you saw a lot of Will East's work uh, earlier this morning when it came to super radiance. Will East has also done a simulation of this process occurring where the, uh, the small black hole actually consumes a neutron star. Uh, so if you'd like to, you can go see fun simulations of that. Um, and so for that very simple model I've talked about, so I'm only going to just think about this heavy dark matter parameter space, we could say where is the parameter space that we can already exclude using an old Milky Way pulsar. And this is that parameter space. And so as you can see, as promised, the exclusion already falls well below current bounds, which sit up here on the dark matter nucleon scattering cross section. Um, this slope that you're seeing is because you can collect less dark matter because it'll be captured into a tinier space um, uh, for a uh, larger and larger mass. Eventually, you'll reach a mass where the black holes you're forming evaporate away, as we talked about, and that's why the bound truncates here. And then at lower masses, your Chandrasekhar condition means that you have to collect so much dark matter that uh, you can't reasonably think about doing that in the Milky Way halo for the Milky Way pulsar we've seen within the uh, lifetime of the universe. Any questions up to here? All right, everyone's very wrapped and good. That's great. So you might ask, uh, what sort of signatures would you look at for this? Could maybe we see a tiny glimmer of this sort of thing occurring already? Uh, so one reason I got very interested in this um, um, about a decade ago at this point is that there was, at the time, and actually remaining, a missing pulsar problem. So we expected many pulsars to be found at the galactic center that were both uh, second period pulsars here the second period pulsars and millisecond period pulsars. Um, and so we actually dedicated a ton of green banks and other telescope time to imaging the galactic center. And when I say the galactic center, I'm really talking about the central 10 parsecs. Um, to date, uh, no pulsars of this variety have been found. Uh, a very bright magnetar uh, was found and is still found when you do this sort of survey, but uh, nothing in terms of an old pulsar. And so some work I did with uh, Tim Linden uh, when this sort of anomaly came out is, okay, can we explain this using asymmetric dark matter imploding pulsars? Um, just to give you a sense of what this is, this is the radio luminosity at uh, six gigahertz, uh, and this is the period of the pulsars. These are just populations of known pulsars to show you where in this parameter space you'd expect to see the pulsars. And uh, this solid line is from a recent 2022 result, which is the most sensitive yet. Uh, that doesn't find any pulsars in the galactic center in this parameter space. Okay. So if I want to think about what pulsar imploding or neutron star imploding dark matter would do to this sort of parameter space, I should think about the fact that the dark matter density increases uh, rapidly as you go towards the center of the galactic halo. And so I can make uh, maximum neutron star age plots for parameter space points. So this would be the one for a dark matter mass of 10 PV and a cross section of 10 to the minus 45 centimeters squared, and this is for 44 centimeters squared. And so I would expect no old, no neutron stars uh, to exist above this line if these models existed, roughly speaking. Uh, and these are sort of all the uh, pulsars that would appear on this plot that you can see so far. There would be a really bright magnetar sitting down here. Um, uh, if I plotted that part of the parameter space. Okay, um, so that brings me to the end of neutron star implosions. Uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about are connections between dark matter and supernovae. That's my time. Uh, you have one more question. It's a two minute clock. Though. Okay, very good. All right, so I'll talk about white dwarf explosions from asymmetric dark matter, and um, uh, I'll talk. I'll touch briefly on how it could be composites, and then there are connections to type 1a supernova, and we can also talk about uh, galactic structure connections. All right, so up to now, we've talked about uh, neutron stars, we've talked about dark matter capture in neutron stars. We're switching gears a little bit and thinking about dark matter capture in white dwarfs. Before I talk about the phenomenology that you can get out of dark matter being captured in white dwarfs, uh, I like to briefly get my head in the right place by reviewing uh, type 1a supernovae and uh, what we know about them. Uh, so what we know about type 1a supernovae is that uh, at some point during the existence of a white dwarf, something heats it up to a certain temperature, which causes nuclear fusion. Uh, specifically, you have either carbon, oxygen, or neon. Uh, these fuse up to uh, uh, a big bulk, about half the mass of the white dwarf, 
uh, of 56 nickel. The 56 nickel uh, in the ensuing thermonuclear explosion then decays to 56 cobalt uh, over the time period that you get really peak emission and then uh, decays from there to 56 iron and this is where we get iron enrichment from type 1a supernovae um, on the order of like tens of days. And so this is what we know about type 1a supernovae at the moment uh, and that's where we'll begin. Um, there are actually two different ways that I like to separate for dark matter to induce a white dwarf explosion. Uh, one of them, uh, which is the way I've thought about it mostly, um, is dark matter forming that same core we were talking about, but instead of inside of a neutron star, it'll form it inside the white dwarf. Uh, it'll reach the point that it's collapsing, and while it's collapsing, um, it'll heat the white dwarf and ignite it. Uh, and I'll go over that in a second. Uh, another way to do it is just to think about dark matter and its passage through the white dwarf, uh, just sort of one very heavy composite state. Uh, this could be a primordial black hole, which is uh, what Graham, uh, Rajendran, and Varela did back in 2015, or it could be um, something like a composite state that uh, has an internal potential energy that it can transfer to the white dwarf material, or it could be a composite um, that just is scattering uh, with the white dwarf. In any case, if you're depositing energy sort of in one transit, you'll get maybe slightly different phenomenology. But in either case, you can think about this causing the white dwarf to explode. Uh, I'm going to focus on this. So uh, in order to ignite a carbon oxygen white dwarf, the dark matter um, in the core collapse case has to be heavy, so that thermalizes in a small volume within the white dwarf and collects that point of collapse within a billion years. Uh, and so we'll have that same harmonic oscillator potential we were thinking about before for this dark matter sitting inside a white dwarf. Um, and dark matter will then collapse, shed gravitational potential energy through scattering, uh, and you then have to do a bunch of calculations and convince yourself that it's reached a temperature in that sort of core collapse region to ignite a type 1a supernova. Uh, now, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but it turns out that uh, more massive white dwarfs uh, cause dark matter to collapse sooner inside their interiors. It's a little counterintuitive because here you might think that I'm plotting this incorrectly, or at least I would have originally. Um, but here, uh, I'm not plotting incorrectly. The more massive white dwarf is actually smaller, and it has a higher central density. That means that the ball of dark matter in its interior will be contained within a smaller region because uh, its density or its thermalization radius will be determined by the white dwarf density. And as uh, this gets smaller, the thermalization radius will also get smaller by half power proportion. Um, and so uh, it turns out that if you have this occurring, then you'd expect this to occur more for more massive white dwarfs than less massive white dwarfs, or to at least occur faster in that case. Um, and so here I can plot a range of white dwarf masses. Um, so 1.4, 1.3, 1.1, 0.9. Uh, and for those masses, you can calculate where in the parameter space here shown for 10 to the 5 up to 10 to the 8 GeV. I would expect the dark matter to collapse uh, within um, either 5 billion years or 0.5 billion years. And so this just gives you a rough sense of what dark matter nucleon scattering cross-section parameter space we're thinking about. Uh, for ignition to occur at a particular temperature, uh, this has been calculated what's required. Um, we don't actually, at this point, have a really good model for how this is supposed to happen in the standard case, but we do know exactly how much you have to heat up a portion of the white dwarf in order to get it to start the thermonuclear flame front that's then going to move through the white dwarf and cause it to ignite. Um, here we're showing different mixes of uh, uh, carbon oxygen. This has a little bit of neon in it, so this can change a little bit what mass of the white dwarf you have to uh, heat to what temperature. Although this is on a logarithmic scale, so essentially if you heat even a very small portion of the white dwarf to above 10 to the 10 Kelvin, um, like a gram or a milligram, you're going to ignite it according to the work done uh, by these authors. Um, and so with all those in uh, sort of conditions in place, you can think about the very simple case of can you ignite the uh, white dwarf as the dark matter collapses, and it turns out this is roughly the parameter space where that could occur but it would occur at different times for different white dwarf masses. Um, and so you want a more a heavier white dwarf if you're looking for an exclusion. And if you think about signals of this, you'll get a distribution of times for your white dwarf explosions. 
Um, you might ask, okay, so then how does this compare to what's known about white dwarfs? But it turns out there's actually a, a white dwarf progenitor problem, which uh, there's a review of it here if you want to go look at it. Um, the leading candidates, I would say, for what's uh, actually causing the bulk of type 1a, if it's not new physics, uh, which it's probably not, uh, is going to be something like white dwarf mergers, or there's some new mechanism to ignite lone white dwarfs that we're not really familiar with yet. Um, this is uh, the, the, the puzzle, which was sort of strengthened in the, in the early 20 teens, is exemplified by this plot. Uh, there, at the time, were textbooks that said, like, oh, type 1a supernovae all have the same light curves because they all come from 1.4 solar mass. Uh, white dwarfs exploding. It turns out that's not exactly true. Uh, there's a range of white dwarf masses that are exploding uh, according to um, how much 56 nickel they're actually ejecting. Okay, uh, so I did some work back in 2015 where I said let's like look at some uh, age of galaxies versus uh, white dwarf mass explosions and see if there's a trend that looks kind of dark mattery because that would be a fun thing to do. And it turns out there is like a little bit of a trend, although this is very messy. And actually the models in order to get to the metallicities of the galaxies and the, the white dwarf masses are definitely things you can you know, think about even including larger error bars than are, than are shown here. Uh, but you can also set a nice bound on this parameter space. Uh, and this is work I did with my grad student Javier, who's now at uh, Slack as a postdoc. Um, and you can think about that same self-gravitation regime I talked about, but it turns out that this parameter space is actually a lot richer. Uh, so in this parameter space, you can think about black hole imploding white dwarfs. And again, Chris Kavaris um, thought about that back in uh, 2010, well before any of us started working on this. Uh, but uh, uh, in this parameter space, uh, according to you know, calculations we did with some updated models for dark matter scattering in the white dwarf interior and sort of structure functions that you need to, to calculate that uh, very accurately, uh, we would say that black holes would implode white dwarfs. Um, uh, this parameter space here isn't uh, quite ruled out yet. If you want to think about uh, dark matter as being something that causes type 1a supernovae, um, up here you get to, into fun regimes where the black hole evaporating can cause the white dwarf to ignite. Um, and then above a certain uh, cross section shown here, you'll get the scattering ignition scenario I was talking about earlier. Uh, here you'll get the black hole evaporative uh, ignition scenario. Um, am I okay? Am I... No? Okay. Great. Uh, so then the last thing I'll tell you about is if you're looking for signatures of this, um, uh, you could look a lot of different places, and people have been doing that over the, the course of the last uh, five years or so. Uh, one place I've begun looking uh, is actually in the structures of galaxies. And so in order to explain this, uh, we have to review something that usually gets brought up uh, when you think about self-interacting dark matter and not the dark matter I'm talking to you about today. Uh, and what we have to review is how small galaxies, or really any galaxies, can have cored galactic halos um, through a process called baryonic feedback. So there's a process called baryonic feedback um, that's been fairly well understood since the uh, early 2010s. Uh, Ponson and Governato had a paper that treated it analytically, semi-analytically, with a, a small simulation and then a full galactic and body simulation. Uh, and the way it works is this. Uh, you have your dark matter sitting in your halo, and it's probably starting out in something like an NFW profile, uh, unless there's self-interacting dark matter. But for the moment, let's assume there's no self-interacting dark matter. Uh, so it's sitting uh, in its halo. Um, it's have a, it has a pretty high density at the center of the halo. Um, you'll also have gas in the galaxy, and you'll also have star formation. Uh, a bunch of stars will form. Some fraction of those will be high mass stars that will give you core collapse supernovae. Um, those core collapse supernovae will go off. The gas will expand. This means that in your galaxy, if I think about an individual dark matter test particle on a closely bound orbit, uh, after the type 1a, or sorry, after the core collapse supernova goes off, you'll get uh, a decrease in the gravitational potential shown here. Uh, this means that you'll uh, end up with your dark matter particles suddenly on a wider orbit. And the point of this plot is that if this occurs very quickly, if that softening of the potential occurs very quickly, then you'll get a wider orbit. Uh, and then if recollapse happens very slowly, uh, the phase distribution of that wide orbit will essentially be randomly selected if you collapse back slowly. Uh, and so you'll get a substantial portion of your dark matter uh, on a wider orbit. And the place that that 
ener that the energy is coming from to put it on a wider orbit is essentially the core collapse supernovae expanding the gravitational potential of the galaxy in the form of blowing out the gas. Happy so far? Good. Uh, so then um, this, uh, this scenario has been used uh, quite successfully to give you um, uh, both semi-analytic and full simulated models of how you get your galaxies to have uh, softer or less dense dark matter cores uh, compared to what you would expect in the classic collisionless dark matter case. Uh, and just to show you what that looks like, here are the results from Ponson and Governato, although you can see similar current results from the FIRE simulations, which use a different simulation suite called Gizmo. Uh, and the model here of uh, either um, uh, an, uh, 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 well, they have a, a few different models that start out uh, with uh, an NFW or INASTO looking profile, and then they do a full model with baryonic processes, uh, giving you gas blowing out in your galaxy. Um, and you'll see that the density at the center is uh, less than out at the fringes of the galaxy, as you'd expect if the galaxy becomes cored. And you can show this both um, with a full model or with just a semi-analytic simulation. OK, so this brings us to dark matter that causes white dwarfs to explode. Here, the, the um, Phenomenology involved gets a little richer. Uh, so you should expect that you still have core collapse supernovae going off in your galaxy. And if dark matter is causing white dwarfs to explode, you should expect that that not only occurs, but it occurs preferentially towards the center of the galaxy. And so we didn't talk about this much, but uh, I, didn't, I didn't say this yet, but uh, typically the um, uh, galactic uh, density, just in terms of the entire mass density, is mostly um, uh, you know, uh, star and dark matter dominated towards the fringes, and this is true of basically all galaxies, and then becomes baryon dominated only towards the very center of the galaxy. And so one special feature if you're thinking about dark matter inducing white dwarf supernovae as a source of baryonic feedback uh, is that it'll occur sort of right where you need the medicine to be in order to create uh, baryonic feedback that cores galaxies, which is really at the center of the galaxy towards the core. Um, but there are additional things uh, you should think about here that actually wouldn't show up in the standard um, uh, core collapse supernova baryonic feedback case. And one of them is that here uh, you'd expect the gas mass, it, it depletes a little as star formation goes on, but it stays roughly the same overall. And so these uh, periodic episodes of baryonic feedback are going to give you um, sort of uh, explosions that uh, widen the orbits of your dark matter by about the same amount every time. Uh, for dark matter-induced white dwarf explosions, while you'd get a huge effect at first, uh, as the dark matter is cored out from the center, as you're sort of removing dark matter um, from the center, that will actually shut off the effect. And then there are additional like nonlinear effects in play that you have to think about including how injecting energy at the center of the galaxy preferentially is changing star formation in the rest of the galaxy. And so in the last few minutes I have, um, I'll go over some preliminary results we have from running a simulation of a small uh, dwarf galaxy, uh, uh, which is actually parametrically, the, we, we chose the same parameters as the original Ponson and Governato paper to, to sort of uh, create a direct comparison. So we, uh, we had a total galaxy mass of about 10 to the 9 solar masses. Um, for such a, a, a galaxy, you'd expect the dark matter mass fraction to be very high, here about 95%. Uh, the gas mass fraction is only 2%, but that's enough to sort of fluff out the gravitational potential and core out your galaxy and give you baryonic feedback. Um, uh, I won't mention the other parameters because they're not so important. I, I'll say that all particles have uh, masses of about 3,000 solar masses. And so this is about a um, uh, uh, third of a million to a million particle simulation. Um, what we're using is the same code base that you would use to simulate galaxies and galaxy formations for like the fire simulations, if you're familiar with those, which is the gizmo code base. Uh, but we've had to modify it to actually track all the star particles, track all the white dwarfs in the star particles, 
and then track where those star particles move through the galaxy and how the white dwarfs in all the star particles would collect dark matter uh, and then explode. And so here what I'm showing you is for the mass point uh, 10 to the 7 GV, where we don't actually have uh, substantial bounds yet uh, beyond direct detection bounds, uh, what the effect is on uh, both the cumulative white dwarf supernovae that you have in the galaxy and the cumulative uh, stellar mass formed as a function of time over 2.5 billion years. Uh, and so there are some interesting things to note. Uh, one of them is that for uh, the sort of highest cross-section you should entertain for this dark matter, you get pretty much what you'd expect. You get a ton of white dwarfs going off uh, relatively rapidly. Uh, but what you might not expect is what we see here, which is that your cumulative stellar mass formed is much, much less than all the other scenarios that I'll talk about in a second. And the reason that's occurring is if you have a bunch of white dwarfs going off at the center of your galaxy early on, you'll blow out all the gas and you just won't form as many stars overall. Uh, the other two cases I'll consider is if I think about a cross-section of 10 to the minus 45 centimeters squared, um, then you get um, uh, something like you know, a moderate amount of white dwarfs forming, uh, uh, giving you type 1a supernovae, uh, and you'll get stellar mass, which is you know, comparable, although a bit below what you would get otherwise. Um, and then here's the line that you'd see you know, what you get with just core collapse super, uh, supernova feedback alone. And so the, the moral here is that you're not actually just affecting the, the, the um, structure of the galaxy, the, the dark matter halo profile, but you're also actually affecting uh, how stellar mass is forming. And that's particularly because you're targeting the most gas rich and what would usually be the most star rich region of your galaxy. And so we're still calibrating this and rechecking results, but uh, as a preliminary sort of result, this, this is looking quite promising for uh, looking into dark matter models using this uh, sort of a mechanism. Um, so this shows you uh, the dark matter density as a function of galactocentric radius. Uh, the same sort of plot you saw earlier from Ponson and Governato, but here with dark matter induced baryonic feedback added in. Uh, so this, uh, so there's, there's some really interesting nonlinearities here to see as well. So you might expect that um, core collapse feedback only would give you, you know, some amount of coring that you expect. And then as you ramp up your dark matter cross-section, you might expect that you just get more and more coring. But that turns out not to be the case. Uh, the reason that's not quite the case is that for this 10 to the minus 41 centimeter dark matter on nucleon scattering cross-section, uh, recall that we didn't form as many stars overall, and that includes core collapse supernovae. So what that means is here, you're getting a ton of white dwarf explosions, but the core collapse supernovae you're losing uh, because you're just not forming stars because the white dwarfs are preventing them from forming actually means that you have less overall baryonic feedback for 10 to the minus 41 centimeters squared than you would if you just left uh, the model alone with only core collapse supernovae. Um, however, for a moderate amount of white dwarfs, uh, you don't shut off star formation as much and you end up with a more cored galaxy. Okay. So that's actually the end of my talk. Uh, and I'll take the questions in a second because this is the end. Uh, so the three things I went over is dark matter heating neutron stars through infall and annihilation, asymmetric dark matter causing neutron stars to implode, connections to missing pulsars, and white dwarf explosions from asymmetric dark matter, and some new work on connections to galactic structure. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I, I see that everybody has now woken up after. Uh, who do I choose? Who's first? Hannes. Or, well, yeah. um, okay, in the plot that you have just shown, uh, yeah. why are there these steps, for example, in the blue curve on the left? Yeah, so these steps are from bursty star formation periods. Uh, this is supposed to happen. Uh, so what happens is you have your gas cooling down, and then a lot of it suddenly reaches the density in the simulation where it says, ah, now all those gas particles turn into star particles. And so in most simulations, you'll get those big jumps because a lot of the, the pockets of gas that you have suddenly all cross that critical uh, threshold for forming stars at the same time. Okay, and then those pockets are exploded, and then So those pockets form stars, and then if it's a core collapse supernova we're talking about, those explosions will happen on the 50 to 100 million year time frame after that, but on this scale, that'll look pretty fast. Um, 
if we're talking about the white dwarfs, it's a much more complicated uh, question uh, because if for the dark matter, we have to track the density of all the star particles that are formed. And then even the white dwarf mass, as we saw, will come into play to determining how quickly that supernova will come off. But a good fraction of those white dwarfs um, will actually go off in that uh, fast time scale after star formation, which, by the way, is, is, is important for the baryonic feedback effect to take place. Um, so, I mean, I, I think, Hans, sorry, I, okay. in view of the time, I think we should, we should stop there. Let's take one more super quick, um, as Gono sets up. Uh, and, well, I don't know who is next, so <laughs> by default. Uh, actually, I have a comment and a question. Yeah. So the comment is on page 27. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about uh, the missing process, yeah, so yeah. you uh, intentionally <laughs> uh, plot this plot uh, in the log scale, and actually that, that the gray region is super tiny. And, uh, That's right. and, and, and the, the volume is the cubic of this radius, I, is very, very tiny. And uh, actually, it's, uh, even you know, the closest uh, part to the Earth, as you showed uh, in your early slide, is, uh, is 70 um, uh, per second. So this is even much larger than this, uh, this region. So I think there is no missing pulsar problem at all here. This is my comment. Um, so the missing pulsar problem actually isn't from this. This is just my plot to show roughly what would happen with neutron star implosions. Uh -huh. The missing pulsar problem actually was proposed by astronomers. And it relates to their models of what density of pulsars and millisecond pulsars they expect in the central 10 parsecs. So it kind of, that's you know, an astrophysical thing, and it kind of varies. But there would be people who would say they expected you know, already, given the sort of uh, available um, uh, luminosities uh, relative to the dispersion measure that sort of disperses yeah. the pulsar pulses. They would, have, they would have expected already to find dozens or hundreds of these pulsars. In fact, that's one of the reasons that they got so much observing time on these radio telescopes, and they still get so, it. So, uh, for, yeah. for, for example, in the radius of 10 per second to the Earth, there's no yeah. pulsar at all. So there's also a missing pulsar Actually, problem. Okay, okay. So there so. should be about one uh, within 10 parsecs of the Earth. But something to keep in mind about the galactic center is it's supposed to be more like a globular cluster, where the density per parsec is much, much higher by three to six orders of magnitude. So that's why. Okay, so my question is, I, uh, in I, your sorry, I think okay. So I will ask you offline. Yeah, uh, you should ask offline. Uh, so let's thank Joe once more.